Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm so glad that you're here. My name is Judy Weisbart, and I am... <laughs> That's pretty cool, actually. Thanks. <laughs> I wasn't expecting that, but I'm really glad you're all here. So many of you are friends from the World Business Academy and personal friends and community leaders, and I'm so grateful that you have all come and that you're all going to listen to something very inspiring and I think really very conscious and hopefully allow us to teach you something and you'll ask questions and teach us something. Uh, before this evening begins, I'd like to thank the Ellen Kanto, who is our partner in this wonderful experience. Sean, our manager, is standing back there. So just so those of you who found us in the newspaper and have come for tonight only, I just want to explain that we are trying to build a community of conscious citizens who really want to change our community in a conscious way. And by doing so, the World Business Academy has partnered with the Ellen Canto, and we do monthly meetings in this room, or in smaller rooms if there aren't this many people. Um, and what we do with that is we are very much interested in hearing from community, in creating community, and in supporting nonprofits throughout our community. So if anyone is giving to a nonprofit at the level of $300 a month, you, you want to come up? About the 101? Oh, <laughs> we're going to discuss that now, Charles. Um, anyone who is giving at the level of $300 per year to any nonprofit in this community, we would like them to become partners with us and we would like to make available some amazing um, experiences at the Ellen Canto and ways that you can join this Global Citizens Club. Uh, we can discuss it later, there's information on it. That is my only ad for this evening. Now that I've said all the things I'm supposed to say, I believe, um, I want to do something that I did last month, and I think tonight, more than ever, it's really important. I'd like to take just a couple of seconds, really, of you all sitting in silence with your eyes closed, taking a deep breath, and coming into this room, being present and being aware that we live in a community that is hurting and that needs all of us to support and love one another and to bring together each and every one of us, so that we can change for the betterment of our community, our society, and our world. Take a deep breath for those who we have lost and those who have lost so much. Thank you. And now I'd like to introduce you to a friend, someone who I have known since he was young, He's still pretty young. Um, but someone who has been involved in our community since he's been on city council and has gone to the assembly and is now our first district supervisor. Uh, das Williams has been a lot in this community and continues to be and is a conscious member of our political process. Um, I'm also very honored that he put me on the Women's Commission, so I'm a commissioner for him, and I will always be grateful for that. Um, after Das says a few words, he does have to leave for another meeting, so we put him at the front of the program. But after that, I'd like to introduce um, Gina, and Gina is going to speak to us a little bit. She is from the Glendon Association. Uh, she is here this evening to talk about the Santa Barbara Response Network. Um, and is training responders for them. Uh, she is dedicated to something which I love the answer to, which is psychological first aid. Right now, so many people in this community need psychological first aid, and she'll tell us a little bit about that after Das comes up and welcomes us and then leaves. So it'll be Das, and then Gina, I'll speak to you in a few moments. Thank you. Well, it's really an honor to be able to kick off this event, and um, uh, sorry that I have to go for another disaster preparedness meeting, uh, this time in Carpinteria, because so many of our meetings have been about or in Montecito. Of course, uh, Carpinteria, um, by only a hair breadth of 
better luck and 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 planning by clearing out debris basins, etc., uh, escape the same fate, and of course uh, remains in the same level of danger um, in the future. So we're doing that tonight. But I will be adequately represented by Jen Krieger over here, who are, is our, our county energy czar. I forget your exact title, but uh, Zarina. Uh, uh, Zarina. Zarina. Um, so um, I want to speak a little bit about some of the things that we can do if we really want to be a sustainable and resilient um, community moving forward. Um, and um, and I'll, I'll talk about two non-energy related ones first, um, right. but ones that definitely have to do with our air quality and climate change. One is, um, as people are doing extensive amount of work, um, just clearing the county debris basins was 60,000 truck trips, okay? There's at least as much material, if not more, on private land. And it will not be done as efficiently on private land as it was uh, with FEMA and flood control. And so we could be facing another 100,000 truck trips on the road or more um, if everybody tries to move all of that mud. And I want to just throw out the question, does all of it need to be moved, right? In many cases, that additional five feet is um, either five feet of additional sandbags that is there waiting for you, or is um, five feet of additional height if your building was destroyed and you rebuild. Five feet of additional resilience. For 5,000 years of human history, cities, probably longer than that, Ha simply build on top of destruction like this, and they do it for a rational reason, which mean, which is that they're higher, they're more resilient, um, uh, and stronger. It's only the last hundred years that we've kind of thought, well, maybe we can just get rid of all this stuff and be more resilient. Um, secondly, um, we need to be thinking about as we rebuild, building farther away from the creeks. Um, we need to uh, structure our planning policies to enable people to build farther away from their creeks. And in some cases, we as a community need to rally around places that are uh, deemed not safe to rebuild and try to acquire them um, uh, for the resilience of the community. Uh, open space around creeks um, can make all of the parcels safer, particularly if you can do some restoration of those creek channels and enlargement of those creek channel, channels to pre-development widths. Um, it's something that is improving the safety in the city of Santa Barbara through the Lower Mission Creek Flood Control Project. It's something that can be accomplished much more rapidly in Montecito if the community rallies around the idea that we need some actual public land in, in Montecito. Um, and of course, the last is, is the question of energy. Um, the numbers, final, final numbers aren't out there yet, but I, I submit to you, once we look at how much diesel uh, fuel was used to um, take care of the disaster, um, the reality will come to us of how a, much of a dirty energy um, uh, our, uh, project this community has been, particularly in the last few months during the disasters. Because when these lines go down, um, uh, they, they have brought in more and more uh, diesel generators so that we can keep the lights on. And uh, our air quality has suffered, but I think more importantly than that, our values have suffered, right? Um, our pretension that we are a leader on the environment, I think, is really open to serious questioning, right? Because all, most other communities in this state have wrestled with energy questions and are building renewable energy. The south coast of Santa Barbara County, 
the, the birthplace of the environmental movement, is one of the few places in the state that has had no utility scale renewable development. Zero, none. We got a zero next to our name. And that is something that I would argue not only for practicality's sake um, of, uh, but that's a, enough of a, of a question in and of itself, but for value's sake, that's not something we can allow to continue, right? It undermines our message throughout the state. Um, Craig can tell you when, when, when we try to lobby in Sacramento for um, these values, it hurts us when people in other parts of the state um, view us as people who talk about it but not build it. We must build it. Um, and um, of course, if we don't build it, um, we're gonna get a natural gas power plant uh, thrust upon our community. Um, and that's, I, I know what we're gonna talk a lot more about tonight. Um, if we do not um, build uh, really, at least collectively, um, between many different parcels or on a, a few parcels, really a utility scale amount of renewable energy, um, that is, you know, 95 megawatts, um, we will in all likelihood have a uh, natural gas peaker plant put in our area. Um, and uh, the irony, of course, um, from the perspective of some folks in this community, is some folks think it would be easier to put a natural gas power plant in this community than to build enough renewables to take care of the problem. And that's something we should go, wait a minute, something is wrong if political observers and developers of energy think it's easier to put a natural gas power plant in Santa Barbara than it is to put a lot of solar and batteries in Santa Barbara County. And so, um, to me, we've got to realize that we've got to do it right here. We've got to do it on our parking lots. We've got to do it um, in the right kind of even open spaces. Because if we do not, uh, the consequences for our environment will be dramatic. Um, but I also believe that the one thing that's powerful about Santa Barbara is look around, look, look around this room. I mean, I, I think a lot of folks, you know, know people in this community. Just the people in this room, um, there's a tremendous amount of talent, uh, treasure, and um, will. If we, um, if we as a community don't let it be acceptable to not be a leader on the environment, then we can change that. And so I'm, I'm pretty inspired to be able to kick off the, the conversation tonight. Um, Jefferson from my colleague Joan Hartman's office uh, right there in back will give me a good report on how the rest of the night goes. Um, and can we give Joan a, a hand because Joan's been an incredible partner on energy um, and the Board of Supervisors. Um, we can get it done, folks. Let's start it tonight. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Doss. I mean, Doss has been a partner in our work for years, so we work closely together on other traumatic events in our community. I'm Gina Carvalho, and I'm here tonight to talk about the Santa Barbara Response Network, which is a grassroots organization made of volunteers. We're an all-volunteer run, <coughs> responding with psychological first aid, which I'll tell you exactly what that is. And what we do is we're invited in by family members, churches, schools, any entity that has experienced a trauma. It can be a suicide, 
a shooting, um, a natural disaster, and our volunteers will go out and be with that person, that family. We can go to the memorials and be present. We were at the vigil that DOS put on. And we are there to offer compassionate support to enable recovery, resilience, and to offset PTSD. Everyone in this room has been impacted. And I'm very touched that the World Business Academy invited me here to talk about mental wellness and spiritual wellness in the aftermath of what we've all experienced. We're all traumatized. We're either first degree, second degree, whatever degree, we're hurting. We were terrified. We are grieving. And our children are scared. And what we did, the Santa Barbara Response Network, with a collective, I brought a page along. This, we are not doing this alone. We are a mental wellness team that's been formed, including the Red Cross, County Behavioral Wellness, Cottage Hospital, the pastoral, all of the clergy, uh, Hospice of Santa Barbara. The list goes on and on and on. We meet once a week, and we look at what the needs are, and we form responses, and we go into the schools, we go into churches wherever there's a need. The Santa Barbara Response Network started nine years ago when we had uh, what's called a cluster or a contagion of suicide in our community. And we uh, brought in, through the Glendon Association where I work, we helped found the Santa Barbara Response Network, we brought in an expert on suicide contagion and he trained us and about 135 community members to offer psychological first aid. Psychological first aid is um, an evidence-based response that is the most effective right after a traumatic incident. There are seven stages or steps to psychological first aid. We offer trainings on a regular basis. And if you want to get involved, I brought brochures. You can email me and be trained so you can be a responder. You can help. Um, and it's basically seven very basic steps for being with a person who's in pain and hurting. And it's extremely rewarding. The, after nine years, we have responded to the Isla Vista shootings, the two family murders that have happened, the runaway track, truck on 154, remember that? I mean, pretty well every incidence of shootings and suicides and homicides we've responded to in one way or another. We respond in the Latino community. We have um, a very strong Latino part. And this, this community trusts us, and we're able to do a lot of work with the DACA, some of the immigration issues we've had. We've been able to support those children and those families. So basically, we're a volunteer team that's able to go out. You can access us. I brought um, a brochure on um, self-care, which is really important. And you can take that with you. Um, and I just want to say that we're in the midst of healing, and this is an incredibly supportive community. And there are resources for you, free, on a sliding scale. And I have lists of therapists, um, Reiki, acupuncture, all kinds of people that can help. So feel free to reach out to me. And thank you for having me this evening. <laughs>